Hi everyone, it's Pastor Kathy. Day two of our Advent study, uh, the time of waiting. We are reviewing the Gospel of Luke and looking at the passages that uh, precede the birth of Jesus. Today I'm sharing with you five through 20. I'll read periodically uh, throughout it and then I'll stop. But I want to share with you um, this sub, sub story, uh, John the Baptist's birth foretold, and give you a little history uh, in the process of, of what's going on in this temple. During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commandments and regulations. The, this priestly thing, this, um, this descendant uh, of the priest, priestly uh, division of Abijah and being descendants of Aaron, that's very important because it, it gives them a standing in the Jewish community. It gives, them a it gives Aaron a standing where he, could, he can visit certain places within the temple and certain responsibilities for that as well that we're going to learn in just a second. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant and they both were very old. This brings back um, memories maybe for you or, uh, but certainly for um, a, a longstanding traditional uh, Jewish priest and, um, and his wife, uh, stories of others uh, that they had heard from the Torah, uh, Abraham and Sarah. Jacob and Rachel, who also had been old and um, had not been able to have children yet. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just, just know that um, these, these stories are back there and, and it's hard not to make comparisons when you hear things like that. So they were old and couldn't have children um, or had not had children. One day, Zechariah was serving as priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. Following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. An angel from the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and overcome with fear. I want to share my screen now. Uh, and show you just a, just a little bit to give you a picture of what this temple looked like and, and where Zechariah was in this. Um, if you can see my cursor, this here is the first temple, Solomon's temple that was built um, just after King David died. Solomon was King David's son. Um, and then this is, uh, this, this uh, Solomon's temple was just destroyed um, in the, um, in the occupation and um, in the exile. And um, Herod, uh, King Herod came back and he had some incredibly elaborate tastes. And he decided that he was going to build back this temple in a more elaborate way. So he built, and, this, and portions of this are still standing in, in uh, Jerusalem, most notably these stairs right here. So this is the front of, of the temple where people would ascend to this door. You, you read in um, the Psalms, if you read those subheadings, they'll say a prayer of ascension. Well, that's what they're doing here. They're coming, they're ascending up these stairs and to this door. Um, and then individuals will come into these porticos. Uh, they were designated for different people. There's a women's courtyard in here. And then up here is, this, is a gate that could be closed or open. And uh, when it's opened, um, uh, certain, certain um, uh, people could go in and it says there's an altar right here. Well, that's not the altar we're talking about. This is the altar where sacrifices could be made. And you can see uh, this portico here that different people could be in that portico, mostly male. Um, and I would say almost all male because this is the women's courtyard, but they could sit in this area. And even those who were out here in the uh, women's courtyard and the, and the other porticos could see through this um, when uh, sacrifices were being made. So there's one altar here, but the important thing here uh, that I wanna focus on is this holy place. You can see this um, sort of upside down T level here. Um, it, the holy place is made, is made into two different areas. And I'm gonna stop sharing here and give you a, uh, a feel of what might be inside uh, the holy place. There's two sections of the holy place. This is the area where uh, Zechariah would be and he would be burning incense. This is 
completely an imagination of, of a rendering of someone, uh, what it might look like inside, um, but that burn the incense here. And then uh, this is the uh, anointing oil and obviously the candles. So all of these had different responsibilities at different times during the day. The incense was in the morning and um, in the evening. And look here, here are the red veils that they're speaking about um, that, that, are, that are referenced in here behind the veil. Um, behind this veil is what's called the holiest of the holy. Now this whole area is called the holy place, but behind this veil um, uh, sits the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the Ten Commandments. And in that, um, in that area, um, uh, only uh, certain priests, the high priest can go in and only uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement. So most of the activity goes on here and only priests are allowed in. And, um, and so that's what we're talking about right here, that he's burning the incense, um, typically takes about an hour to do that. He's waiting to receive um, revelation from God and, and saying prayers and making sure that that incense continues. So, um, so then this angel appears. Um, to, to his side, and understandably, Zechariah is startled and overcome with fear. When we, uh, when we hear that startling, that's, that's kind of not surprising because all of a sudden something just kind of shows up. This overcome with fear um, is something for you to think about. You know, what, it, would we be fearful? Um, and is that true fear or is that like an awe-like fear um, if, if a, a messenger from God were to come to us? Um, and, and uh, you know, we're thinking elaborate kind of winged kind of angels, um, could have just been a man, could have been, could have just been, you know, uh, something, but, um, just think about what that word fear means. Um, here you've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and now your response is fear. That's, um, that's interesting. I think the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. I was talking about this uh, particular passage in one of the classes that I lead on um, Sunday morning and someone reached out, well, why, why are those prayers heard now? Why now? Why this particular time? Why, why weren't they heard before? Um, another good question uh, to, to ask yourself, um, you know, how long must I wait that lament? And um, I'm waiting for uh, dot, dot, dot. I, I responded to uh, the individuals in this, in, in the class, okay, we're waiting and maybe God is responding and we're not accepting that. Maybe it's a different thing than we really want. So, um, so this, your prayers have been heard. You have to listen for what that answer is as well and be willing to accept it at times. But presumably their prayers had been that they want children because the angel says, your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to your son, and you must name him John, which is different than any of the, uh, the hierarchy and followings. Um, John is not in the family name here, so that would be unusual, but this angel is telling them, you must name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many people will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the Lord's eyes. He must not drink wine and liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. This is really important. Two things. He will be filled with the Spirit before his birth means that that Spirit is already working. And that Spirit is working not just for John, but for all of us, even before we acknowledge God, any, any time before that. Uh, John Wesley called it provenient grace, that the Spirit continues to work and God continues to work within us through this grace that we may not even know about. Um, and we're going to learn more about this spirit and how we know that spirit was there when we read some next week. The other thing that's interesting is about he must not drink wine and liquor. Now, clearly priests could drink wine. Wine was served at, at all kinds of places. So why not let John eventually drink wine and liquor? Well, we're going to hear um, he will bring many Israelites back to the Lord their God. He will go forth before the Lord, equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah, who was a prophet. So you start getting this understanding that he might, he, John, might actually be a prophet. And here's where it gets confirmed, because it, these are prophetic actions right here. He will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children, and he will turn the disobedient to righteous patterns of thinking. 
He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he will make ready this people. He will inform them and he will point the way um, to get them ready to be prepared for the Lord. That's all prophetic and that's all prophetic stuff. Now, imagine that, that he's getting everybody prepared and um, he had been drinking wine or he had been drinking liquor or he had, he had somehow been, um, his mind was not, not the same with, with wine. He was drunk. Um, it would be way too easy for people to say, don't bother with him. He's just drunk, right? I mean, it, 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 I'm sure that many of you have heard drunk people talk before and they just ramble and ramble and ramble sometimes. Um, so taking this approach where he won't have wine and he won't have liquor, he won't, he won't let it cross his mouth, that, that that's going to take away that excuse that people will listen to him and not say that he's drunk because he doesn't drink wine and doesn't drink liquor. It doesn't say that nobody in the world should drink wine and liquor. That's not the intent of this. Um, the intent here is to uh, give John uh, every indication that he is a prophet and, and is speaking clearly and, and has credible resource uh, to, to do that. So Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. Well, come on. Remember what I said before, Abraham and Sarah, Rachel and Jacob, um, that, that it's not outside the question that old people can have older people or people past a certain age, which we don't know what that means. It could be 40. I don't know. It could be 80. Um, but but it's not out of the question that they can have children. It had been done before, and uh, or it had been shown before, and and it, it from an angel an angel from God is saying it will happen again. So Zechariah turns and and basically says, "Okay, I'm not sure if I believe you really." And Gabriel gets kind of upset, and Zechariah says, "Why should I believe you? How can I be sure of this?" And the angel replies, "I am Gabriel." And we're going to learn that Gabriel speaks uh, very highly to a lot of people. I stand in God's presence. I've been there. I know. He gave me these words. I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news to you. Know this. What I have spoken will come true at the proper time. But because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. Here's another waiting, uh, another Advent waiting story that we hear. What, uh, what is true, and we hear the story and the hope of the story, and the hope of the gospel story is that Christ is born, and Christ resurrected, and Christ uh, rose, and, um, and, and we have hope in this promise, just as God has given us, um, that God will uh, keep all promises, um, that, that we are waiting for that time. And right now we're, um, we're waiting with Zechariah for uh, the Messiah to come into the, into the world. So, so what Gabriel does is kind of, kind of neat. You know, he says, well, I spoke to you, you didn't believe, therefore you are not going to speak until this actually happens when we can, when you can have the proof that you need. And in that time, you know, I kind of think of it like, I'm going to send you to the corner and you're going to think about what you've done. Um, that that uh, you're you're not going to be able to speak, and therefore you're going to be waiting in a very anticipatory way, not just for the baby, not just for the coming of the Messiah, but to get your voice back. And it leaves us hanging a little bit. And I'm going to stop here. It leaves us hanging. That what will happen when his voice comes back? How will he use that voice? So I encourage you uh, that over the next couple of days, as as you reflect on what this is. Uh, think about who was waiting in this and why they were waiting. Think about in, in our lives, those people who are waiting and how we might be able to bring them comfort and hope that, um, that their lives are wonderful uh, just as they are even when they're suffering. Um, that that uh, being, being fearful is, um, is a wonderful thing when it's an awe type thing but that we are there to support each other when we are truly afraid of something and we are struggling to step out and, and say something. And then think about as uh, Zachariah is waiting, um, what's he thinking about with, uh, with this quietness? What's, what's going to happen? We'll learn a little bit about that over the next coming uh, days. I hope to see you again soon. Bye.